Okay, so good morning or good afternoon to, uh, to everyone here. Welcome to the creation and workflow session of the Dataverse community meeting. Um, it's good to have you here. I think there are people joining in, but I think we, we start with our session. Perhaps you would be expecting um, Sebastian here as a chair of this session, but he was double booked as a, a presenter in another session. So I do my very best to represent him represent him here um short i don't know, don't mean that we need much of this please just keep um muted um unless you want to talk um raise your hand if you want to uh, have a question or want to participate or just use the chat to ask questions and share informations and if you are talking please consider turning on your video this session will be recorded and the recording will be made public. We will have um, three slots um, with two talks each for this session. Um, start with um, outreach, then over to creating challenging data and last slot will be about machine accessibility. So we will try to, to um, keep something like 40 minutes per slot and have the Q&A um, section after the second talk of the slot. So our first talk will be um, by Christina Chan Park, Laura Serre and Laura Walk um, about getting to know you results of the Texas Data Repository User Survey. Um, Christina Chan Park is the STEM librarian um, coordinator at Baylor University, where she currently is a research librarian for physical sciences and data. She's also a workshop leader for the ACRL Roadshow Building Your Research Data Management Toolkit, integrating RDM into utilizing work. Laura Serre is the government information and data librarian at Texas A&M University, and Laura Walk is the digital collections librarian at Texas State University. She manages the Texas State Digital Collections Repository and the Dataverse Repository. So, um, Christina, Laura, Laura, the stage is yours. <clears throat> So good morning, I am Christina Chan Park. And um, as Dorothea mentioned, I am the STEM Librarian Coordinator at Baylor University. I am Laura Sayre and I'm the Government Information and Data Librarian at Texas A&M University. Yes, and I'm Laura Wad, the Digital Collections Librarian at Texas State. Um, and today we're presenting a summary of a user survey of the Texas Data Repository. Um, a link to the slides is in the notes document, and after we finish our analysis, um, the data will be available in our repository. So the Texas Data Repository, or TDR, um, is hosted by the Texas Digital Library and uses the Dataverse platform for publishing and archiving data sets and other data products created by faculty, staff, and students at Texas higher education institutions. There are currently nine participating member institutions, Baylor, Texas A&M International, Texas A&M, Texas A&M Galveston, Texas State, Texas Tech, University of Houston, UT Arlington, and UT Texas. The assessment committee of the TDR steering committee conducted a survey asking over 40 questions in spring 2022 in order to find out who uses the TDR, why they use the TDR, how they use the TDR, and what research data management best practices they follow. For the purposes of getting feedback to the steering committee as they plan for training, outreach, platform development, policy, and help with our directions moving forward. The survey was sent to 1,027 users on February 1st, 2022. Um, reminders were sent to non respondents on February 22 and March 10. The survey closed on March 22nd. There were 123 responses, yielding a 12% response rate. Response rates for individual TDR institutions range from 10 to 22%. Out of the 123 respondents, 44% were faculty members, 23 were non-faculty researchers, 12% um, graduate students, and 20%
had another status such as librarian. We had one undergraduate fill the, um, or complete the survey. Um, 87 respondents um, told us about how they hold, how they heard about the TDR. Users um, mostly learned about the TDR by word of mouth, either from a librarian or a colleague. Um, and no one indicated that they learned about the TDR from a non-library campus office, such as the campus of research. Um, um, <clears throat> so this could be an area of outreach. Faculty and graduate students are the least likely to create an account just to download data and the most likely to create data sets and collections. Non-faculty researchers and those with other statuses are more likely to download data. Of the 20 respondents who have TDR accounts but have not deposited any data or downloaded any data, most indicated that they created their accounts in anticipation of depositing data. Others created accounts in order to download data or for training or learning purposes. So when asked about why depositing data, um, a pleasant surprise was that most respondents deposited data as a best practice or to support open science and scholarship. And in the comments, respondents noted data preservation also as a motivating factor and the ease they have with sharing the link for funding agencies and publications. Next slide. So when asked why they chose the TDR specifically, most respondents noted that it being free to use for the researcher was a motivating factor and also the convenience. So no one indicated they identified TDR through the RE3 data registry, which was interesting. And in the comments, several folks indicated they'd chosen TDR specifically because it supports their institutional efforts and they wanted to be sure that their research is affiliated with their university. So we did also ask if respondents considered other repositories and some did mostly open science framework or dryad, but the majority found that the TDR dataverse met their needs and they didn't need to consider other options. And um, we also asked about when people deposit their data versus when they publish the data. And most respondents indicated they deposit their data after it's collected or when they're submitting for publication rather than depositing during the research project. Um, once uploaded, most of the respondents publish immediately when submitting after the publication or after the research is complete. So in the comments, it was noted that also a lot of researchers wait until the funding agency embargo period to actually upload and publish. And uh, another thing was um, mentioning depositing their data. Of the 93 respondents that had deposited data in the TDR, most, about 40%, indicated this in their data management plan and many others either didn't write a data management plan or they couldn't remember if they did or not or they weren't sure what a data management plan is so that was interesting too um, and then another pleasant surprise was most respondents indicated that they do include a readme file or other context document with their data um, and of those that did not it was mostly that they didn't find it necessary or they didn't really know that that was something to include. Pass it on. A majority of users who shared their DOI did it as part of a publication, followed by sharing with co-researchers co or researchers who requested access to the data. It was good to see that those who did not intend to share was only slightly more than 1%. For those who selected other, some manually added the DOI to their Google Scholar or ORCID, or they shared on their CV and grant reports. Um, if people found data in the TDR, most of the data downloaders got the data through a DOI or a URL, or by searching the TDR itself. 
For those who selected other, they mentioned it was sent to them by another researcher or a librarian. Um, for those who were able to use the data the way they wanted, over 60% of the respondents were able to, and most of the no answers were because the data was not relevant to their needs. For those who selected other, they mentioned they were either testing, using the data as a model, or that the file they tried to use was corrupted. We asked about the help features and most participants had looked at our user guide. After that, it was a three-way tie between our TDR policies, contacting their TDR liaison, or using their local library website. For those who selected other, most said it was too long ago for them to remember. Here we asked what new features users would like to see in the TDR. We drafted some multiple choice answers that we had heard about or were working on, such as large data sets or R integration, but they were also allowed to make their own suggestions. Most of those suggestions were for integration with other specific software packages. When asked if they would recommend the TDR, the majority of the respondents said yes for either to deposit or to find data. Our key takeaways include that faculty, researchers, and graduate students are our primary users. Having a free, easy to use repository was appreciated by researchers who recognize data management best practices. Our study also found some areas for improvement, um, for example, handling larger or sensitive data sets. And finally, in summary, um, the most wanted improvements or features were long-term archiving, wanting to increase the file size possible to post, and again, features to enable the sharing of sensitive data. Thank you. So thank you very much for this very interesting information and all interesting results. Um, is there a, a urgent follow-up question? Yes, Robin, rise, please. Uh, I don't know. I have a raised hand from Robin Rice. I've, I'm allowing her to. I just had to set her to talk. I I, I could just unmute myself. Um, thank you. Uh, sorry, I don't know how it's how urgent it is, but um, what while I'm thinking of it, uh, it's very interesting and there's not a lot of comparative information about this kind of thing. So I'm wondering, um, well, your key takeaways indicate, you know, you, you're pretty happy with the result. Um, what, what did you make of the data usability uh, results where some people um, found the file corrupted or, or didn't um, find the software uh, format to be usable? Do you think that means that you know there should be changes in the way it's curated, or or do you think um, that's the kind of reasonable results? I'm not being judgmental. I'm just I'm just wondering what what you thought. We haven't really done a deep analysis. This is sort of a, a summary um, because there are only two users from the the TDR. Um, it's not an anonymous survey, um, so. Um, we can actually follow back up with people and see what the, the actual problem was, um, whether it was on the depositing error or whether it was on the user error. Um, so we, we haven't decided what to do with all of that. But um, like you said, there's not a lot of other surveys like this. So if anybody wants to take ours and adapt it, and we can sort of maybe compare different installations, whether they have similar problems, whether the, you know, the ratios are about the same, um, we're happy to share um, our survey questions. That'd, that'd be great. Um, uh, I'm, I'd like to get your slides. I haven't found them yet. But, um, uh, I think they're in the, if you click on the, the title. Okay, I'll look for them and, and thanks. And if we do manage to get a survey off, I'll, I'll be in touch. Okay.
Okay. I don't see any other direct question. Um, perhaps we uh, postpone other questions after the second talk of Sadia Ghazali. Um, Sadia, will you do your talk now live or shall I? Yeah, see what it looks like. <laughs> Yeah, uh, let me share my screen first. So just shortly introduce you. Sadia Ghazali is data management officer at Worldfish since May 2019. Sadia's main responsibility is to facilitate and to manage data with the Worldfish Institutional Data Repository. Okay, and Sadia, the floor is yours. Okay, um, let me know if my screen is on. Okay, yeah, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Thanks for this opportunity and the chance to present the performance dashboard that used to visualize the engagement on Wolfish database. So before that, let me introduce myself and thanks for that you know, introduction, Dorothea. So my name is Saadia Ghazali and I am the data management specialist from Wolfish. So we currently based uh, in Malaysia. And as the Wolfish Database Admin, I help in facilitating and maintain the Wolfish Data Repository and also oversee the overall knowledge and data management in Wolfish. So before proceeding with my presentation, I would like to say thanks to all of the Harvard Database team for, for all of your tremendous and amazing effort in supporting the Open Data Initiative with this creation of the open source repository and web applications. So moving on to the next slide. So oh, yeah, um, this presentation will, will be divided into three subtopics. So first, um, I'm going to be brief on some key facts on Wolfish Database, followed by the reason on why we develop this kind of performance dashboard, the motivation behind it, and how it affects the institutional performance. Lastly, I'm going to introduce all of you to the dashboard and briefly explain through it. So some introduction on Wolfish and the, and the Wolfish database. So Wolfish is a global research and innovation institution that focuses on sustainable agriculture and fisheries. So we established in the year of 1975, originated from the University of Hawaii as a fisheries research center. So we're also part of the one CGIR, the world's largest agriculture innovation network, where we also joined by other research centers such as the Alliance Biodiversity Seed, um, um, CR, uh, ERI, ERI and other research centers. And our first deposited data set in the database collection was in the year 2016. And up until now, we have more than 170 data sets archived in Wolfish database with a count of 7,000 and more um, download counts for our uh, files and data set. So uh, actually the Wolfish database is customized database collection. Uh, does it means that there are no software installation where all of the supports and technical systems uh, are provided by the Harvard database team. So yeah, this is the yeah the home page of our collection, the Wolfish database. So practically the same like the Harvard database feature. We just have an additional of our institutional logo in the upper left corner here. So if any of you are interested to know um, our data sets, I mean the collections that we have in here, so feel free to go into the Wolfish database and we have, I paste the link in here in the slides. So yeah, next uh, on why, why do we actually um, design this kind of performance dashboard? Um, originally, there are there is no plan to create this kind of dashboard, so we just share some figures and charts to our leaders for reporting purposes. However, through the, through the guestbook feature, the archive metadata information, as well as the download statistic information, we figured that this information is something worth to be shared with our fellow colleagues. So what can I say is that this performance is actually a performance visualization of the knowledge products archival. It is also visualize the accessibility and the usability of our data sets. And somehow it does provide um, kind of indirect motivation for researchers to make their research data available for the knowledge sharing. And in a summary, we found that this kind of visualization on the achievement for an individual, individual database collection um, help in promotes the concept of data sharing. 
Yeah, so without uh, taking more time, so let me bring you guys to the dashboard. So we have in here the Power BI. Yeah, this dashboard was designed used the by using the Microsoft Power BI. So this is the first page of the Worldfish Database Performance Dashboard. So this dashboard visualizes the user's activities back from the date of the Worldfish Database inception until the latest quarter of the year. So as you can see that under the title, um, the dashboard title, there is some small note in here. One small note mentioned that this data, this dashboard is updated until the quarter one of 2022, meaning that this data is up until March of 2022. So it's kind of uh, have this information of the uh, the data sets collection and also about the download statistics. So if you can see there, there are actually um, kind of uh, uh, summary infographic as well as uh, four other types of infographics in here. So in the first section, we have this number of how many published data sets are in our collection right now and whether how many of them are actually open access, how many are still in the restricted access mode. And then from that, all of the collections, how many download counts that we have. So in total, we have 7,889 download counts from um, different institution and from various location around the world. So these two information uh, the last two information is actually extracted from the guest book uh, question. So we added uh, customized questions asking from which institution are you and exactly from where location so that we just want to know the spreading of the users that use um, Wolfish data sets. So, and then in the first infographic we have is actually a stack column chart on the monthly download rates. So you can see like in, in, in average how many um, data set has been downloaded per month based on different years. And then we also have um, um, below the stack column chart is actually a table of the top 10 downloaded data set. So it's actually arranged from the highest number of the downloads followed by the second next uh, highest, the, 10, the top 10 download one. And next we have, we also have the the map of the users, the downloaders uh, location. So from here, we can see that the overall um, layout of the users are from the yeah, Euro and then we have from the North America continent in which this map can be zoom in and zoom out. So if uh, any of the uh, viewers who see wish to see um, specifically from where exactly the users, they can just zoom in and find that this is from Virginia, for example, and then we have one from North Carolina. Yeah, and following with that, um, with this location map is actually the profiles of the downloaders. So how we categorize is actually we categorize the downloaders, whether they are from professionals, whether they are undergraduate students, whether they are student from um, high school student or college, and then whether they're academician or maybe postgraduate students. And yeah, from, from this three map, we can summarize that most of the users of uh, Wolfish uh, dataset came from the professional's background. So maybe they are researchers or scientists from this, um, this institution. And then undergraduate students uh, do also download most of the data. So, and, and their main purpose stated was for their research studies, where they're doing their masters or yeah, the PhD projects. And this, this all of these information can be filtered uh, by years and the figures are interactively and live. So for example, if you want to see the, the proportions and the pattern from the earliest year, you can just click on the year 2016 and then you can see that on the year 2016, there are only five published data sets since we just started using the, the Harvard Database platforms. And then, yeah. We, and then you can see that from here, the download count is not that many. So we just only have 24 download count for five published data sets. And then moving on to 2017, we can see that the download counts is increasing from a two digit numbers to a three digit numbers. And we have an additional five more data sets. So in the total from 2016 to 2017, there are 10 data sets published in the Wolfish database. 
and then comes to 2018 you can see that yeah the numbers keep increasing with um, with the download count it comes to 300 something it comes to 2019 yeah it also um, increasing the numbers keep increasing and then when we go slightly to 2020 we can see that the the download counts uh, are increasing um, in very high numbers. So we can see that very hyperbolically of increasing numbers. It means that starting from 2020 until now, people are getting aware that these data set are publicly shared and people can use it. So we can see this is a pattern set starting from 2020 that uh, the users of a shared data set is really increasing among the community. Same with the 2021, and then yeah, we have 2,300 counts come to 2020 because we only have information up until the month of March. So we have a count of 549, but I'm pretty sure by by this June, we, only, we already have like 1,000, maybe 1,500 download, download counts. And then if you wish to actually see the Collection from for multiple here, for example, you like to see from 2020 until 2021. So just click, simply click on your control key on your keyboard, and then you can choose to have a uh, multiple years uh, information on that multiple years. So yeah, from 2020 up to 2022. So we have um, a published data set of 102, and then yeah, uh, 5,735 of download come from multiple of places and that from different profile. So yeah, uh, back into the, um, in this table of top 10 download, downloaded data sets. So for example, the viewers would like to see exactly which um, data set is the information of why this data set are in the top 10. So simply click on your right click and then you can copy the values and go to the net new tab and paste the value where you can see but it can bring you to the exact um, data set on the Wolfish database. So, so, okay, next, uh, moving on to the second page. So, yeah, the second page information is uh, more on to the uh, on Wolfish data database uh, profile. So, you can see that um, most of the uh, access type done in Wolfish Dataverse is to actually download the data set with a small proportions um, of XX type used to view the data and read the document that available in the in the platform. And then the next um, next uh, figures is the uh, uh, categorization of the data set by each subject. So from here we can see that most of the data sets in Dataverse are actually under the category of social science, followed by the medicine, health, and life science uh, kind of data sets. And then we also have some in the agricultural science, followed by the earth and environmental, environmental science uh, subject category. And then, yeah, this word, uh, word cloud in here is actually um, all of the search keywords that has been done in the search facet under the uh, Wolfish Database website. So we can see that the word Bangladesh, the word performance, the word coral, the word GIF, which is the synonym for genetic farm tilapia, are actually um, among the highest frequency uh, of keywords. So this is the actually things that people are searching for in the Wolfish Database, which is uh, closely related to the fisheries uh, studies and research. So the last information that is being shared with the user is actually all of the control vocabularies associated with our data set. So we have a couple of um, keywords uh, that we use uh, agrobook. So if any of the users would like to see the, actually the glossary, the, the definition behind all of these um, important keywords, they can always go to the keyword and then um, copy and then yeah, they would, it will bring them exactly to the uh, agrobook link. Yeah, and, uh, I guess that's all for the dashboard. And then I'm bringing back to to the slides. Yeah, slide yeah. so it's about two minutes left. Okay. So, yes. 
Is when you yeah come to the come to the last slide. So uh, a future feature that um, that can be suggested maybe to have this kind of infographic features in all of the database collection homepage. So maybe uh, we can have this kind of information shared in the I mean the homepage of the each database collection to have to have people know how many published data sets are in the collection right now, how many is uh, are actually in the open access versus the restricted mode. And then maybe you can have information on the download counts for all of the data sets in the collection. So this could be like a, um, like a performance uh, performance presentation for all of the users in the database, uh, in the Hubble database. So yeah, could be some future suggestion. So I think that's all from me. Thank you. So thank you very much Sadia, for this great insight to your um, dashboard. I think this for sure very interesting for everyone. So we have time for questions directly to Sadia or also to Christina and Laura and Laura um, for our questions about outreach and information. So just raise your hand or use the chat. See, okay. We have a question in the chat, I think from Christina about um, where the data comes from. So what were your data sources that you presented in the dashboard? Okay, so yeah, some of the data are, are actually from the metadata information that we archived. Uh, and then some of it came from the download statistic information that I asked uh, Julian to send me an information every quarter of the year. So I actually asked Julian, can you send me the download statistic information for Wolfish database collection? And then Julian will send me the script. And then I use that script to from the Google collaboration and I run the script and it would give me the information about the download statistics. So from how many, how many counts per data set. And it also brings also the guest book, um, the answers on the guest book uh, questions. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, perhaps a follow-up question in the dashboard. There was a question for me. There was um the the downloader's profile. So information about what role the downloader has. Where does, does you get this information from? Is this from guest books or you get this somewhere else? For the downloader's profile, yes, uh, I got it from the guest book because in the guest book uh, features, we do ask from which institution uh, the users from. And then we also I also added one more customer's questions where I asked, um, uh, uh, in which, I um, mean, from where are you actually located from? So I use the information together with your institution uh, information to figure out also they are actually from these um, universities, from research institution. And then I kind of categorize this could be people from the academia, people from the universities, people from uh, uh, post, uh, yeah, people from uh, like students. They also mentioned they are from high school student of this of these yeah, countries. Okay. Thanks a lot. We have also one question from the Q&A for you, Sadia. So from Jen Doty, Sadia, was the dashboard built using metadata taken straight from your database or did you have to pull together from different sources? Okay, I think you kind of answered this, this already. Okay. Then, uh, Okay, already answered, thanks a lot. And we have another question in the chat from Katie, I think for Christina and Laura's. You are question, were you surprised by the survey responses or did they track with what you already knew from interacting with users? I think it depended 
Um, so for instance, the read me question, I thought that the answer was high, but Laura Sarah thought it, the answer was low. So she might be doing a better job um, training her researchers to add read me's than um, I do at my institution. So we haven't gone through to see if there were institutional differences um, in some of the questions. And so we, we're thinking that might be the case and um, then we can customize um, like the kind of training we need at each of the different institutions. Um, some of the institutions are don't have um, very many users or very many um, deposits, so it might be less useful for them. But for uh, the larger institutions that have a lot of deposits and users, um, it might show deficiencies in where we need training and curation. Laura, do you have anything to add? I found it interesting that, um, and this might just be because of the audience we were asking, since they already deposited their data, that they were so, that they understood that this was a best practice and it was important to them. Um, so it'd be interesting to do a survey of researchers outside and see if, if the word about um, open access data is spreading throughout the research community, or if, if we, are, we were just targeting people that already um, subscribe to that right. belief. Um, so one of the analysis I wanted to do was um, for the, the people who seem to have better practices, you know, put in readme's and uh, mention DMPs to see whether um, so we know when they, we, we can find out when they joined the TDR, like when they became users. Um, and so maybe people who've been doing it longer have best, better practices than people who, you know, just, you know, popped in two months ago. Um, and because the data is not anonymous, um, we might be able to find out whether, how many grants they have um, and some grant funding that will take a little bit longer because, um, that data is not as accessible, but um, we might be able to ask the uh, other liaisons just to, you know, if this person has a grant, maybe they have better training because they're required by the, the funding institution. So. Yeah, I'd just throw in one other thing I thought was interesting. Um, some of our respondents, quite a, quite a few noted that they heard about the Dataverse from their graduate students. So that was kind of interesting. Um, might be something else we could look at, but. Okay, so thanks a lot for the questions and very interesting answers. And we are perfectly in time for the next slot of our session about creating challenging data. So if there are no other questions to our first two talks, we would move on to our next talk by Silene Boyd and KT Mike from Harvard Un Library about curating large library collections in the Harvard Dataverse repository. And Silene Boyd is the manager of the Harvard Library Research Data Management Program. A new program connects members of the Harvard community to services and resources spanning the research data lifecycle and helps to ensure that Harvard's multidisciplinary research data is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Katie Mika joined the Harvard Library Research Data Management Program and the Harvard Data Was Curation Team at IQSS in December 2019. In her role as data services librarian, Katie advocates for enriching computational literacy, data stewardship, and open science for students, researchers, and librarians across disciplines. Katie and Silen, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Dorothy. Um, hopefully you can see the slides up there. Um, and for Katie Micah and Kaylin Boyd, we're going to talk to you about 
curating some challenges we encountered with curating large and large library data collections. Um, these two projects we undertook as part of Harvard Dataverse Curation Services, um, specifically the custom services that we offer to new and existing Dataverse collections. Um, Katie's going to first talk about her work on the Leon Levy expedition to Ashkelon, and then I'll talk about my work transforming an archival collection of Hope Library materials to data. And we're happy to answer questions after the talk at the end of the session or also via email. So please, Katie, go, go forth. Okay. Um, thanks. I love that we have a whole two talks on curating challenging data sets because our challenging collections, because that was, I think, and that's gonna be the main takeaway from my section, at least. Um, uh, all right, Kayla, next slide, please. Yeah, that one, perfect. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Um, okay, so here is the Dataverse collection page on Harvard Dataverse for the Leon Levy expedition to um, Ashkelon. Just to give kind of a quick overview of the project. Um, on our end, um, we were the effort was to curate the data from a 31-year-long archaeological expedition in Ashkelon, Israel. Uh, the collection consists of photos, illustrations, maps, objects, and observations that are consistent with an archaeological dig site. Uh, all right, next slide. Um, and to give a little more information about the um, expedition itself, um, it did have a significant impact on the fields of archaeology, history, and anthropology, as um, you can see on this slide. But in addition to the academic impact, the expedition is also committed to public outreach through the publication of several monographs uh, by running an annual field school that introduces undergraduate students to archaeological methods. Um, it restores major monuments that were excavated at the site. Um, and they're also committed to the development of innovative ways of sharing the history of Ashkelon and its excavations with students, teachers, and the general public. Uh, okay, next slide. Um, so for our project to curate the data from this excavation, um, as I mentioned, the data collection period lasted for 31 years from 1985 to 2016. Uh, and then the Harvard Museum of the Ancient Near, Near East contracted us out at Harvard Dataverse to curate um, about 60,000 images of photographs and illustrations uh, from the dig. So our job was to deposit all the photographs and illustrations uh, into Harvard Dataverse in an organized collection. Uh, and these are photographs of the site itself, of things found at the site, um, all sorts of photographs that were taken um, during the excavation. Um, and then illustrations are like digitized drawings of um, things that were found, of sites, of um, again, all sorts of things, but they're you know illustrations, not, not digital photographs. Um, the parameters that are really important to remember for this collection is that we needed all digital items to have their own DOI for citing purposes. Um, and then all digital items must be individually connected back to the expedition's data management system. Um, okay, so next slide. Uh, so to give a sense of this um, data management system, active data are all hosted on this platform called um, Ochre. The, this expedition um, was the original pilot project for this database system. Um, and what it has, it, it really includes a lot of information on the objects and their contexts, um, so the objects that were found in their contexts, including uh, you know, descriptive metadata and GIS information, um, and all of this is then attached and published in the research reports. Um, so here our goal is to preserve all the images in Harvard Dataverse for reference by researchers that are already using this platform to investigate dig data. Um, okay, next slide. And then here's um, a kind of a screenshot of what you can access in the database. Um, it connects the registered physical items that were cataloged by archaeologists, again, with the location data and shape files, mapping the excavation site uh, with the 3D digital renderings um, of found digital objects in many cases. Um, there are photographs that were taken in the field and illustrations drawn of the site and then, as I mentioned, digitized. Um, our project, oh, next slide. 
So our project um, was to publish and archive the photographs and illustrations from this expedition to, again, preserve the long-term access to the digital records um, and make it possible for researchers to cite items referenced. So on this slide, you can see on the left-hand side is still in that ochre database, one of the records for an object that was found. Um, then there's a photo of it that is linked to the data set and the image file um, on Harvard Dataverse. Um, okay, next slide. So um, our curation strategy was to kind of not wing it at first, but wing it a little bit at first. Um, we had a pilot with about 500 images that we um, deposited in demo server using um, Pi Dataverse, which went swimmingly. Pi Dataverse is wonderful, easy to use, highly recommend. Um, it took a while to run the script, um, but ultimately we thought it was going to, you know, be pretty okay. Um, at this stage, we also determined that we were going to use a um, one to one image per data set, uh, which means 60,000 data sets, each having one file. Uh, if you want to go ahead and click again. And so this might be a reasonable uh, immediate reaction to that statement of 60,000 data sets, each with one file. Um, but it made sense at the time because we had to assign 60,000 DOIs. Um, at, the, at that point, and still, we, we weren't quite ready to turn on file-level DOIs, which is possible in the Dataverse software, um, but we don't have it enabled in Harvard Dataverse just because of the scale of the number of data sets that are deposited every day on Harvard Dataverse would kind of immediately blow up our DOIs um, very fast if we were automatically assigning a DOI to every single one. Um, but we did need a DOI for every single one of these images. Um, it also probably wouldn't have made a difference to do it that way just for the DOIs um, because once you have more than a thousand images in a single data set or a thousand files in a single data set, you start to um, kind of reach the limits of the UI pretty quickly. Um, and we were definitely going to have data sets that had more than um, a thousand files per data set if we had organized it that way. Um, and that'll make sense in a second. So if you want to click again, Kaylin. Um, okay, so we plan to start with um, the photograph collection, which was a little bit less than 30,000 images, and organize all of those photos into sub collections by year, um, and then create data sets using the CS CSV metadata template upload process that PyDataverse makes possible. Um, so we have a photograph collection and then a sub photograph sub collection of each year of images um, with one data set per file. Okay, next slide. Um, this created a lot of challenges. I think I've already um, foreshadowed kind of what we're going to be talking about right now. Um, all right, next slide. So this is the original um, kind of workflow that uh, we started with. So um, this original strategy created a data set and then added a file in a single step, which then um, was looped about a thousand times, depending on the size of the subcollection. Um, to create um, each data set. Um, I would then run through some QA while the data sets were in draft status and try and fix any issues that came up. Um, and then I had a separate script that would publish um, the entire sub collection once that QA was finished. Um, all right, next slide. Um, I think one more slide. Yeah. Um, so this created a lot of issues. Um, it took a long time to run. It would crash the repository. So almost every single time I would run a batch of images, I would crash Harvard Dataverse, which is obviously not what you are looking for. Um, sometimes files would not get added. Uh, the file type would not be correctly assigned. And sometimes data sets would, be, would not be created um, without any kind of warning message or errors. Um, and then also the, the Publishing script took even longer to run and would result in a lot of locked data sets. All right, next slide. Um, here are kind of the changes that we added. Um, you know, we quickly reached the limit of our knowledge on the curation team side for kind of what the infrastructure limitations were, why things were not working as well as they should have been, why we were getting all of these errors. Um, so we kind of, we we reached out to our development team and sort of asked 
hey, what are some optimizations that we can leverage to try and get some of this working a little bit smoother? Um, and basically what we ended up going with was um, kind of reevaluate or re refactoring the um, curation script code that would um, check to re check to see if the database has finished re-indexing and then um, if and only if that was successful, could it be allowed to move on to the add an image file step? Um, and then it would also do the same check after the image was added before it would go back up to creating another data set. Um, and that, that worked much better. Um, files would be consistently added. Um, we still ended up with a few data sets that wouldn't be created that we discovered in the QA phase. Um, but I also stopped crashing Harvard Dataverse a lot. So that was definitely a positive. Um, the solution for uh, improving the publishing script was to add in just an obscenely long sleep at the end of each loop. Um, so something like 30 to 90 seconds was pretty necessary to ensure that um, the registering of the DOI would not result in a locked data set. Um, all right, I think that's basically it. Um, the major lessons that we learned in this project were um, that it's vital to invite a developer and engineer that has a very deep knowledge of your Dataverse installation to um, collaborate with on the project plan. Um, you wanna try and test with a realistic batch size. Um, starting with 500 images was not sufficient for this project at all. Um, and then write flexible and readable code so that when you do have to ask for help, people know what you are trying to do. Um, and that is it for me. Off to you, Caitlin. Thanks, Katie. Okay, so um, my brief uh, talk is going to focus on workflow challenges and considerations that we encountered with another project that uh, followed on from Katie's. Um, I, I started it after that, so I was able to take advantage of some lessons learned that she had um, and incorporate them into this project. Um, this is a project that involves the collections to data activity involved that involves Houghton Library's Slavery, Abolition, Emancipation, and Freedom Collection. Um, there's a link to the collection on the slide, and we can also drop one in chat too in a minute. So this digitization project uh, began in 2020. Its main goal was to digitize Houghton Library's materials relating to African-American history and culture. The collection includes a mix of printed and handwritten materials that include things like letters, drawings, novels, poetry, and broadsides. Currently, there are over 1,200 digitized objects with more to come. Uh, in addition to digitizing these relevant materials, the SAFE project also conducted some experimental handwriting recognition on the manuscripts and also aims to transform these digitized uh, materials into publicly available data sets on Harvard Dataverse. So that's what I'll focus on today. Um, some of the challenges and considerations we encountered. First of all, it's the size of the collection. There's 51 gigabytes of content that's spread across 1,227 digital objects with over 76,000 images, text files, XML, and JSON files that are associated with it. So it's a fair amount of files. Um, they're not all very large, but there's a lot of content associated with it. Um, the project also has some custom metadata, um, and that's of relevance to folks who are uh, working with, um, with archival materials, because of course we know there's not like an archival or bibliographic custom metadata block that's available. So maybe there should be. Um, the digital files, uh, digitized files were deposited to Nextcloud, which is a cloud storage provider. And uh, moving files between Nextcloud, uh, Harvard Dataverse, in particular Demo Dataverse via VPN, sometimes related, uh, resulted in some network hiccups. So that's interesting. And then there was also this question of curation, user access, and documentation. Um, do you have, um, do, you, do you curate based on file type? So put all the images together, which could result in, say, a data set that has 100,000 files, or do you split them apart and do it on a per uh, digital object basis? And so you'd have at least 1,227 with more coming. Um, we also created some um, uh, machine readable relationship files that relate the data set files to one another, um, because ultimately we did decide that the best way to do this um, after some experimentation was to do uh, one data set per digital object. And then we intend to develop some readmes and scripts that will support common ways of engaging with the data sets moving forward using this approach. So this two minutes slide left. Will... Oh, okay. About two minutes left. This, 
Sure, no problem. This slide gives you uh, kind of a high level overview of the five step uh, workflow uh, that starts with digitization of materials. Um, one good thing about this is it's going to work for almost all of our library digital collections, both the ones that we've already digitized and moving forward. Um, I use Pandas Library, uh, the Python Pandas Library extensively to manage and manipulate information about the files. And then, of course, like uh, Katie mentioned too, I use PyDataverse to perform um, API operations. Another key element here was that I used, um, uh, I created a CSV log file to parse and catch any kind of API uh, error so that I could easily programmatically go back and repair data sets as needed. Um, the next slides just give you some screen captures of what you can see when you actually visit the collection that's housed on demo, uh, data, uh, demo Dataverse right this second. There's 185 objects, which is obviously not the total, but I thought about the, the small batches, doing it in small batches, um, and took that approach. So it was very successful. Um, moving forward, once you see, um, we're going to um, uh, finish up. Um, we've done a bunch of tests. You can see the demo, uh, the tests that are available at the demo database, dataverse. We're going to create this um, metadata block, custom metadata block for the project, um, and then move forward with basically um, generalizing these scripts so that they will work for any existing and future Harvard Digital Collection. Um, some of the key things, key takeaways, um, Pandas is really great. So is PyDataverse, two, two great utilities to, um, for this work. Um, successive tabular ingests may fail, which is something I discovered, and so hence this repair process is very important. And then keeping a log, uh, generating an automatic log that you can parse to easily go back and programmatically repair data sets is also pretty valuable. So with that, we can move on to some discussion. And I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much for this very interesting insight. We already have, I think, one comment from Sebastian in the Q&A sections, but I think Katie has already seen this about um, using DV uploader for uploading the files. And yeah, yeah. I can answer just really quickly. We, we did um, look at DV uploader and um, both um, the direct S3 upload. It seemed like they were better for um, making large file transfers easier. So if these image files were gigantic, it would have helped. Um, or especially in the case of DV Uploader, it seemed like it worked better for uploading many files to one data set. Um, we didn't do extensive testing um, on that because it once we sort of knew that we weren't working in that way, um, we didn't move that much farther, but I, I think looking at DV Uploader maybe more and, and optimizing something that would make that file transfer more efficient would work. Um, but we had a number of other issues with exactly how the file transfer was happening, um, coming from like a box.com, Dropbox-like um, location into my machine and then up to Dataverse was the, Took, was the longest process. Um, so yeah, I would be interested to hear more about um, someone that has used DV Uploader for lots of data sets, not just lots of files in one data set. Um, so yeah. Just taking a look, I see also um, Oliver has kind of a, a related question about um, sending uh, data from Nextcloud to Dataverse. So what I did there, um, and this and uh, Katie kind of alluded to this also, um, what we did was, in general, use the desktop clients, and we've tested this both on um, Nextcloud as well as Open uh, OneDrive. Um, I didn't try Google Drive for this experiment, but I have tried Google Drive's desktop um, for another example, and that was how that was how we did it. And this, there is that interesting path, right? The the fact that you're going to go from you know cloud to your desktop through, say, VPN in this case. And um, uh, again, I did encounter some hiccups. Um, our, when speaking with our IT group, um, they actually asked us to use um, the desktop client because of security concerns. 
Um, but uh, Katie and I both have a, a question in with them to see, are there some other options that we could use for removing large quantities of data like this that wouldn't necessarily go through, you know, through your home machine, essentially? Um, so that was one question. Let's see, what was the other one? Um, did I use Nextcloud workflows feature to automate the uploads? I didn't um, because I was only using the desktop client. And so I just used, you know, um, a combination of Python uh, to, to schlep the bits. Were there other questions? Okay, so that I don't see any other Great. questions. Thank you. Um, in the chat or in the Q. A, are there any ways, Sam? Katie, Katie is, yeah, Katie was ty is typing an answer to Sebastian's question in QA, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think she already answered it. Okay, then let's move on to our next talk from Catherine Claypool about using metadata to catalog when protected data can't be stored in data with another talk about creating difficult data sets. Um, Catherine Claypool is a research data management manager at Knowledge Enterprise at the Arizona State University. Her experience includes coordinating metadata taxonomy for interoperability and managing tier one support for in-house web and the client applications. So Catherine, the floor would be yours. Thank you. Um, and thanks everyone for the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing at ASU. Let me go ahead and start <clears throat> sharing. Okay, can everybody see the slides? We good? Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our data diversity issue and how we're using uh, metadata to catalog when we have data sets that are protected and can't be actually stored for download in our Dataverse. So just a very quick bit about Dataverse at ASU. We are, our, our Dataverse instance is connected to our main library portal. So if you were to go to the main library portal and search for anything that happens to be in Dataverse, it would actually come up without you being in the actual Dataverse searching as well. So those two things are connected. And we launched the main instance in October of 2020. Um, and about a year later, what we did was we launched a research data uh, repository hub um, last October. And that is our first restricted metadata only collection in our ASU Dataverse. And just a little screenshot there to show you what that looks like. Um, so some of the use case data sets that brought this to our attention and why we decided to do some of the um, things that we did with the metadata were uh, primarily it started with our health information data sets that are available for research at ASU. We have access to public health surveillance data Medicaid data, Medicare data, and eventually we're going to be including things like the health information exchange data that um, we're currently working with a group on. The other uh, use cases include data set subscriptions. So we have different departments across ASU like psychology, the business school, and criminal justice who may be uh, have professors in those areas who are subscribing to large data sets uh, that wouldn't be um, necessarily a right to put out there for download on our Dataverse instance. There are also specialized data sets where researchers have created uh, data sets that may require a little bit more process or orientation for, for use. Um, and also value added data sets where maybe a researcher has taken something um, like two different data sets and put them together to create more of a value added data set but they may just be way too large to transfer in their entirety on the actual instance. So starting with the health data sets, just to give a little bit more information here, um, our department is what we call the ASU Honest Broker between the Arizona Department of Health and researchers at ASU and across different types of 
um, departments like we have a, a College of Health Sciences, we have a nursing school, et cetera. So we are that broker to help it, um, the health department transfer those data to researchers. There's a lot of process there. There's not only the ASU IRB, but the health department itself has their own human subjects review board that research projects would need to go through in order to be um, approved. And then once they are approved, transfer of those data sets um, may require some manipulation. And we also have a requirement when using some of these data to use them in our secure environments. Some of the data sets uh, that we are getting through the health department for this honest broker um, responsibility include vital statistics. So it'd be births, deaths, hospital discharge data, immunization registries, infectious disease surveillance, and also the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, which at the federal level is downloadable from like say the CDC website, but at the Arizona state level um, is not available to everyone. And a lot of researchers in Arizona will need that because it'll have zip code level data. And these, all of these data sets are available as fully identified as well as limited what we would call limited data set, which could be identifiable. So um, that is the protected nature of those sets and what's kind of set off this particular um, instance of us doing the research hub. So here's just a couple of screenshots of what we're doing. Um, we have in the research technology office, which is part of Knowledge Enterprise where I am, there is a extensive website that we have available to the ASU community. It's, a, it's on the public website, um, explaining what the health data are that are available and um, very, very brief information about it. And what we decided to do was create a, a button on that website that would take people directly to the research data repository hub that we created um, where the Arizona Department of Health Service data sets are listed in a lot more detail. So there's, a, there's just a lot more detail there. Um, and some of that detail includes, you know, adding the ADHS logo. We added a link that takes people directly to the public health statistics website um, page on the ADHS website so that they can read that additional information if they want. ADHS does have some downloadable data there, but it, it is obviously all either fully de-identified or in most cases, summary data, which wouldn't allow much um, access to like research at a, at a finer level. We also um, put in the description of the metadata record in our Dataverse hub, a lot more information about it. So it's, it's very brief on the main website. Once you get to the Dataverse hub, there's a lot more information and detail. And then we also added a link to the actual ASU request form for those data. So they can add, they can just click straight from there to request those um, data. It takes you back to our website where the process is kind of outlined for folks as well as the form um, is available. And then also on the license and data use agreement part of the metadata record, we had to list the custom data set terms so when it comes to subscriptions and specialized data sets, some of those examples would include um, the business school, for example. We know that there's been situations where multiple professors in the same school have subscribed to the same data set. And of course, these organizations aren't going to tell you that so-and-so in your department's already subscribed. So it would it's a real um, important thing for us to try and help the schools have a central location for some of these subscription data sets and to kind of cut down on costs that way. Um, and it also kind of helps network them together in, in, in situations where they don't know that other people have already um, subscribed. Also, our research computing area at Knowledge Enterprise has developed an extensive social media database that they've done um, for machine learning and AI from Twitter, for example. And those data have been, um, really uh, worked with a lot. There's a lot of information and caveats about working with these data sets that they've created. And so one of the um, use cases for that would be, here's a, here's a data set that's available for use, but we really wanna put a process around that, give orientation to how to use those data before people just download and start doing research. And then the value added 
example would be, we have researchers who download GIS or other images um, from Arizona for different types of research who may have used other data to layer onto that or to stitch together. And so these images are really much more than just a GIS image that's raw, that's actually been value added. So there may be, again, an in, in a situation where those researchers want to make those data available, but um, there's just a lot more information around them, or they may just be too big to upload in their entirety. So they would be also good situations for a metadata only catalog record in the research hub. So just some of the quick benefits of what we're already seeing from doing it things this way is that it does provide a central location because we're linked to the library search as well um, to locate these sensitive data sets and protected data sets and not um, try, to, try to access them in, in some other way. Um, it does eliminate these duplicate purchases for subscription data sets, but also one of the things I think is a, a really big benefit is just feature, the features of Dataverse itself really support a consistent process and contact around obtaining some of these other data sets. Very easy to update the information if we had a new form or there was a contact person, et cetera, that needed to be updated. The metadata in Dataverse is very flexible. Some of the nuts and bolts about what we did was tagging was really key for us to show these protected data sets as, as not open access. So we had to kind of um, figure that part out. We used a primary tag in the field, uh, metadata field called kind of data, and we added an ASU-affiliates-only designation there. Um, they, the developers also created an endpoint feed from the tag that removes that open access icon from the actual listing so it doesn't show. I just did a quick screenshot here to show you what I'm talking about. There is usually an open access icon at the bottom of some of our records. Um, and we do, we do know some of this deviates from the typical fair and open data practices, but um, I think this is a really good way of, of at least allowing folks to find these things and, and the process being a little bit more transparent. So thank you. And that was all I had. So thank you very much, Catherine. That was great. Um, looking for questions um from perhaps other okay there's a question from richard dennis how did you eliminate the dui from each of the data sets um i actually i don't have what well, we don't we don't have a data set in there it's it's just a metadata record so it's it's basically a cataloging of metadata only. I don't know enough about the nuts and bolts. So I do know that our developer is on this session. So if she does have an answer to that question, um, she may have to put it in the chat, but I don't believe these required a DOI, but again, not knowing enough about the nuts and bolts behind the scenes. Yeah. Oh, That's thanks, fun. Sebastian. Yeah. I, <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I would um, have an. Uh, yeah. Sorry, okay. sorry, Dorothea. Yeah, um, Deirdre says we did not remove the DOI. Okay, cool. So I would have another question. As I understood, have you thought about using the data access um, um, functionalities of DataWorks itself? So as I have understood, you do not put the data itself on Dataverse, but just somewhere else and also put the requesting of, of data access also on your website and not within Dataverse. Yeah, the data access itself is through the process. So it's not actually available to download to just anybody for from anywhere, actually. So because these require a, a mostly a dual kind of IRB process um, and we are also requiring people to use these data in our secure environment only. Um, they, they will get delivery of those data once the, the research project has gone through the process. And so it's sort of a completely separate thing. It's not gonna be downloadable probably at any point. Okay, thanks. 
So are there any more questions to Catherine or also to Katie or Kaylin? Or other discussion points about creating challenging data? Okay, so just a comment from Sebastian about we have an open issue on GitHub to use guestbooks as data request forms. But there is also functionality on data was about a data request. So this is what we are using. <laughs> okay, but as I do not see any raised hands or additional questions in the chat or in the Q&A, then it's just for me to thank you again, Catherine, and thank you also again, thank Katie you. and Kaylin, for, for your very interesting talks. And then we move on to our last slot of this session about machine accessibility. And our next talk will be from Wim Hugo from Dance about a minimum set of machine readable and actionable licenses. Um, and to introduce Wim, Wim Hugo is the chief technology officer for Dance and Institute of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences that focuses on provision of high quality state of the art digital repository services for research data and the provision of expert knowledge in the field. Okay, so the floor is yours. Thank you, and I hope you can see my screen. Yes. Okay. All right, thanks very much. I'm going to talk a little bit about licenses and the automation of the provisions in licenses. It, to some extent, it has a, a, a good uh, connection to the previous uh, presentation because our motivation in part is the fact that um, we need to handle quite a large variety of access and license conditions and then provide some way of automated access to those um, resources, irrespective of whether they are hosted by our Dataverse instances or not. And that's essentially where, uh, where this requirement came from. So um, a little bit of background on, on licenses. Um, licenses, of course, uh, ultimately reflects the rights of the owner and then indicates which of these rights can be afforded to the end user. And there are really two extremes. The one is that all rights are reserved for the owner and you basically do not have any rights as an end user or that uh, the works are put into the public domain and all rights are waived. Uh, so um, there are no limitations uh, or obligations or restrictions on using the work. Um, and then maybe another point that I find interesting that is sometimes conflated into access conditions or a license, and that's the one of an embargo, because an embargo really doesn't change the license. It is more uh, a point in a workflow or a time period associated with a workflow in the publication states of an object. So in our proposals, we are not including embargo into license provisions. But what is quite interesting is that we're encountering data sets now that can only be made available for a certain time and then they have to be destroyed. And that's quite an interesting use case. I haven't really figured out exactly where and how it fits into license and access conditions. Okay, so license elements generally uh, to provide a, a bit of additional context. Um, comes from a variety of, of uh, thinking on the subject. Uh, the, I would say at the root of much of it is a project or a, a set of specifications, the open digital rights language that basically derives uh, provisions such as permissions, prohibitions and duties or obligations from a policy and then um, there are uh, consequences if you don't uh, comply, there are remedies and potentially uh, things that uh, need to be done uh, if, uh, if a permission is not uh, provided. 
So um, that's the broad contextual framework into which many of the license encodings and machine readable license encodings, uh, many of them are based on this. Um, there's an interesting project that you may have come across called uh, Dalek.net. Uh, what they have done is to base an analysis of a large portfolio of uh, existing licenses. Uh, they've analyzed that based on the ODRL and they have derived a common vocabulary for describing the provisions, the permissions, the uh, duties, the obligations, uh, the limitations and so on, and made it into machine readable format. And they've also made good progress with some value added uh, uh, services, such as for selecting a license based on the, um, the characteristics that you desire, and then also uh, to suggest licenses that can act as a follow-up license for a work that combines inputs uh, using different input licenses, which I think is very useful. So Dalek exists essentially as a potential register for any public license uh, that can be machine readable and can be integrated into their other services. Within the Dataverse context, there has been some implementation and also some additional pull requests and ideas around data tags. Um, they are not a bad idea, but they address privacy only. And we feel that there are additional considerations that require similar license provisions, although the motivation for uh, selecting that particular license may not always be the same. And it also does not address directly the idea that some data can only be processed in controlled environments, uh, which I think is also an important consideration for us. And then based on data tags and some additional considerations, there has been development of um, mechanisms or algorithms whereby compliance can be evaluated. So it encodes typically a set of uh, license provisions as a graph-like data structure. And then it also maps the uh, characteristics of the end user or the software that wants to use uh, a particular work uh, into that graph. And then it, it is relatively easy to find correspondence or uh, agreement between uh, the characteristics of the end user and the characteristics of the license. Uh, for even very complex licenses. So this will be a very useful uh, approach. Now, our analysis at the moment is looking towards what we would call managed access licenses. Uh, we try and avoid, avoid the term restricted access because it sometimes has other connotations, especially in the scholarly publication field because the access to these uh, data sets remain open. Uh, anybody can find and access and use those data sets provided that they meet a certain set of additional uh, provisions or are compliant with an additional set of provisions. So these no harm licenses or provisions as we like to call them at the moment are needed primarily to protect the subjects of research and not to arbitrarily or unnecessarily restrict access. So the idea of as open as possible and as close as necessary uh, still apply. Um, and anyone that meets those qualifications, as I said, uh, will be granted access. And one of the most important aspects for me in terms of research transparency is that the basis of access must always be known before it is requested. And it cannot arbitrarily be imposed by the depositor or the rights owner after the request has been received. So the outcome of a request must be predictable in a sense uh, even for slightly qualitative requirements, such as that the, the research must protect uh, or the out type, typical outputs produced from the research must not be harming the interests of the subject matter. Um, I still think it is a, an ideal to have the basis of access 
completely transparently known before access is, is requested. And then the other uh, interesting aspect of this is because um, this is not about the individual requesting the access, but about the way in which the data will be applied in many cases, um, we cannot universally grant access to a data set uh, for a specific individual because the way in which they will be using it and the end products that they will be creating actually determines whether uh, access should be granted. And this is slightly problematic because it requires us to evaluate each request uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. And it's uh, in some cases not possible to provide uh, access to an individual or institution uh, in general. Okay, so we've uh, qualified uh, the motivations uh, in terms of protecting subjects into five categories, that it must avoid harm to individuals, to communities or cultures, to the environment, to commercial interests or any other security concerns. And we are thinking that we can formulate additional provisions within the, uh, the encoding structure of a service such as DALIC by making these no harm extensions uh, an obligation on the end user because the rights holder is obligated to protect the rights of the subject matter. And what we are doing is to extend those obligations to the end user by making sure that the rights of the subjects are still protected. So that's the way in which we would like to implement many of these uh, license provisions that we want to, uh, to create in, in future. Just as a matter of interest on the left-hand side, there's a little bit of a, uh, as usual, a mismatch in vocabulary between uh, what free culture licenses call these groups of provisions and what the open uh, digital rights uh, language calls it and what GitHub calls it. But by and large, they can be mapped to one another one-on-one, uh, -on -one, so it shouldn't provide a, a huge problem. So we're thinking of establishing a, a set of licenses that are variations of the theme of the typical uh, free culture licenses, such as Creative Commons, uh, and then uh, give them appropriate names. Now, I call them no harm licenses, but that's by no means the best possible nomenclature or labeling for these licenses. So any ideas about it uh, can be uh, shared and it will be very welcome. But in broad terms, these licenses vary in terms of whether they require encryption, whether there is access control, um, whether uh, there is some kind of disclosure involved and whether controlled processing environments are required. There is an additional column there that has to do with the ethics uh, requirements, but I think uh, in our first iterations, we will probably ignore that because that's a little bit more complex to, to, uh, to address. So from our perspective, I think we're gonna end up uh, for our current implementation with a set of maybe five additional no harm licenses, as we call them, to satisfy all the combinations of encryption and controlled access uh, and uh, controlled processing and so on, together with typical public domain licenses uh, or CC4 by licenses that uh, form the, the basis of, of our current uh, collection. So, if we may move this forward in one of our projects where we have some funding to experiment and, and see if this will work, then we're going to formulate a set of no harm provisions as extensions of the data tags encoding and add obligations and limitations in the Dalek, in a, in a Dalek uh, compliant registry, probably Dalek itself. And then we register a portfolio of new licenses that extend the appropriate Creative Commons licenses with additional provisions. So that gives us a set of machine readable and actionable licenses that uh, can be read by, by any uh, system or process uh, via the API. And there will be a mapping back to data tags uh, because the data tags will then, in essence, be special cases of some of these uh, proposed licenses. 
So that's the long and the short of it. The future use of this is firmly in the in the realm of automating uh, access via what we call a data access brokering process uh, to to data sets that have these limitations or obligations uh, uh, attached to them, and uh, to to scale up uh, what in future might be quite an onerous task for depositors to evaluate uh, requests for access to data sets uh, manually and individually uh, all the time. And it won't solve all of these cases, of course, but uh, anything that can help with it uh, will be uh, very, very useful. Thank you. So thank you very much for this very interesting talk. We are still good in time, perfectly in time. Thanks again for this. We have a question from Sebastian in the chat about thinking back to yesterday's discussion theme is no harm sufficient for indigenous data and sovereignty. I think sovereignty would require something more. <clears throat> yeah, so sovereignty, um, potentially not, but protecting the rights of indigenous communities, uh, their uh, culture, the ecosystems that they rely on, that's far firmly part of it. Um, the data sovereignty, uh, at the moment, we are only considering situations where we say that a processing environment has to be secure, but the characteristics of what that processing environment is that we are able to place a data set in after request has been granted or access has been granted, presumably can be extended to say that you know, the, that environment must be within the borders of a certain country or meet certain IP address requirements. So I think we haven't specifically formulated that use case, but uh, thinking quickly about it, I, th uh, I think the controlled environment in which you can use that uh, data set is probably extensible to include it. Thanks a lot. So perhaps perhaps another question from me. Um, perhaps I have missed this, but all your additional licenses have um, for ex ex access control a, a yes there. So there yes. will be for each of these licenses, there will be access control. So Yes, that's the whole point of it, because uh, maybe I didn't uh, convey that uh, very strongly at the start. One of my main concerns is that you, if you encode access limitations or controls um, in the software that you're using, as we do in Dataverse at the moment by specifying uh, access conditions, that doesn't accompany the data set if it would migrate to a different repository, for instance. Um, so you, you and it's not machine readable in the same way that the rest of the license might be. So I would prefer a solution where you have one inquiry to a registry where these licenses are encoded, and then you can get everything that needs to be taken care of by people or machines in, in one place. There is some resistance to the idea of mixing access conditions into a license, I must say. And uh, yeah, not everybody agrees, but I'm sort of uh, of the opinion that it will take a long time to find consensus about it. And if we can make something that works and uh, satisfies the use cases and protects the, the interests of the subjects and the depositors, then you know, why not? Let's go ahead. Okay, thanks a lot. So are uh, there... Any other questions? I think the discussion in the chat is still on having your eyes on data sets, <laughs> not on you. Yeah. Um, okay, then, um, as I don't see any raised hand, then perhaps we move on to the next talk. Thanks again very much. Perhaps we have some more questions in the Q&A afterwards. And then I would like to introduce Mahmoud Shad. Um, who is the Associate Director of Research Software Engineering as the FAS Research Computing Department at Harvard University. 
He works with Harvard's FAS RC team to design, build, and maintain scientific software packages and data services to address the needs of researchers from different disciplines and to accelerate cutting edge research at Harvard. He will talk to us about fair computational workflow support and data worth. Thank you very much. And Mahmoud, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, for your introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone for your presentation. I really enjoyed listening to great topics. Uh, today, I will go over our work uh, on supporting computational workflow uh, in Dataverse. You can see the uh, names on this slide. I'm just presenting our work. Um, so uh, in this presentation, I'll go over uh, Harvard Data Commons, what are the goals uh, or team, introduction to computational workflows for those who are not familiar and how we are going to support computational workflow in Dataverse features and challenges and what are the future directions. Um, so Harvard Data Commons started 2019. Uh, people from different departments, libraries, research computing centers, uh, and the goal of Harvard Data Commons is automating the flow of research data from research computing environment to management, publication, discovery, and preservation environment. Uh, and when we say research computing environment, that's mostly where people are, researchers are keeping active research data. And sometimes the size might be an order of gigabytes and terabytes or even more. And um, the goals for Harvard Data Commons, of course, it helps to meet or sponsor requirements in terms of data integrity, provenance, and reproducibility of research. Um, last year, <clears throat> we defined three objectives. And uh, one of the objectives is so to support computational workflow in Dataverse. The other is to, to, to basically automate the pipeline between the research computing infrastructure and Dataverse, where you want to make data available in Dataverse through uh, integration through globes. Um, and also the last one is automating connections between research systems and key library systems used for archiving and, and publication. So in objective two, which uh, I'm presenting or teamwork today uh, and our progress, we have people coming from different backgrounds from research data program, uh, people doing metadata analysis, uh, people from Dataverse team, uh, that are doing the maintenance of the Dataverse and are familiar with Dataverse software. People doing product research, data curation, UI, UX software development, project management and research software engineering. And that combination helped us to, to research the challenges for computational workflow and, uh, and how to, to support it. So, <clears throat> um, if you are not familiar with computational workflows, uh, there are many dis uh, dis descriptions you can find in uh, literature. I like the one uh, listed here from this uh, reference uh, in the gray on top right, uh, which describes computational workflow uh, uh, as a precise description of the multi-step process uh, to coordinate multiple computational tasks. And maybe we are, uh, talking about these computational tasks, each task could be running a code, uh, calling a command line tool, access to database. Um, you may want to submit a job to on-premises cloud or commercial cloud, or running a data processing pipeline and more. And the purpose of these tasks are uh, a mix of these um, purposes, like data collection, preparation, analytics, predictive modeling, simulation, and more. So in this figure, you can see an example of computational workflow uh, where you may have data uh, dependencies. For example, here we have data input from different resources, database, flat files, or from API uh, or cloud. And depending on the, the logic you define your computational workflow, you may follow different paths um, for each task. And it, these tasks, uh, they have different data dependencies, either from previous step or from <clears throat> external resources uh, as input to that specific task. And 
the output of this computational task is uh, data products. You, you have seen like in papers, uh, the, the, the figures, the plots, uh, tabular data, any data product uh, uh, could be the result of this computational task. And many researchers are using these um, workflows, but they are not familiar with this concept. They, they may just call it my code or my software. Uh, and there are some <clears throat> uh, frameworks, languages, standards to define these workflows. We just call them standard workflow definitions. You people in bioinformatics are using CWR widely. Um, Nextflow, SnakeMate, there are there are many of them. Galaxy, and uh, but there are also researchers, uh, uh, which is also a significant portion, are just using uh, programming and also tools uh, for the everyday research and they create workflow with them like Jupyter Notebook, R Notebook, MATLAB, Live Scripts, Bash Script. Uh, and they can define uh, their workflow using these, these tools. And our goal is not just to limit the support to a specific uh, and a standard workflow definition, uh, but just allow users to define it in a variety of ways. Uh, and we we studied the uh, this area for a few months uh, as a group and we defined a set of features for or minimum viable product what we are going to to add as our mvp phase and what are the features we should consider for post mvp within this time frame so these changes will go live by the end of june and uh, and these are like enabling upload of computational workflow uh, in Dataverse, <laughs> enhancing user experience when they add new data sets, and also uh, for new researchers looking for this computational workflow help with uh, discoverability, like metadata tagging, advanced search. And also we added baggage support for packaging files and helping with uh, transfer validation between different digital libraries and also documentation for new and advanced users. We also added four examples of computational workflow uh, that can be used as an example for researchers if they want to know how they can define what are the, you know, uh, the uh, fair principles they, they need to follow, how I can reproduce this uh, data sets using your computational workflow. And these are these will be accessible in the documentation, R Notebook, Jupyter, CWL, um, and MATLAB. And we we consider a few we consider a few uh, features for post MVP um, support for a specific workflow visualization. Let's say you take a CWL and you want to visualize it, uh, the flow, information extraction from uh, workflow definition files, input output methods. There are already uh, uh, websites that are doing this, running computational workflow through third party integration. Uh, whole tail and code ocean. Like for whole tail, there's already a, a pull request and we just need to review and after uh, MVP phase to consider integrating with Dataverse. So researchers can run some of the standard workflows, let's say Jupyter Notebook and R Notebook that uh, not the standard, in a, uh, like a widely used uh, uh, workflows that so they can, uh, they can run these uh, and check the results. So uh, we added a new metadata block called computational workflow metadata. We studied bioschemas version one and code meta, which is for a software. Bioschemas is for computational workflow. And uh, we considered only a few terms for MVP. And as you can see, they can choose workflow type, uh, which is a mix of standard definitions and also uh, other, other, way, other uh, ways to define computational workflow. They can point to the external code repositories where they, they are keeping uh, a current uh, version of the workflow for maintenance, for community involvement, and also the documentation. They can either type a text uh, or just point to external documentation if they are, for example, keeping it in a reader doc. Uh, we <clears throat> added a few uh, features for uh, to discover workflows uh, under the dataset feature. 
they can uh, filter the results to computational workflow. And also, uh, if there are any workflow in the results, they can also see the workflow type and, and just filter based on that specific type. Also, once they go to, into the files, they can find the uh, workflow by the file tags. These are added during the upload process. For each file, users can specify custom file tag or choose from the uh, drop-down menu predefined tags. And we added workflow to make it easier for them to point to the uh, workflow. And also um, in the advanced search, uh, they, can, uh, they can also narrow down the results to the specific workflow type. <clears throat> yeah. So um, we added Bagit support. Um, it helps with integration with digital libraries. It's easy to implement. There are many tools that you can you can do it. Uh, transport validation. What we added is support for multiple Bagit upload, and uh, we generate errors in case of uh, in case of errors like in, for example incorrect checksum values. But in order to save computationally in the backend, we stop the uh, processing once we reach to a certain number of errors. For example, in this case, five errors. And we are thinking uh, about adding uh, Bagit download for all data set as, as, as a post MVP uh, phase. Um, of course, there has been challenges. Uh, we are still working on these challenges. There are one, the first one is there are various ways to define computational workflow that makes support uh, uh, challenging. For example, people defining computational workflow in batch script just by using a C++ code or Python code. Uh, those that those, those were computational workflow in, let's say, common workflow language or other standard way of de defining uh, computational workflow, they are easier to support, but we cannot limit our users to just specific tools. User onboarding also. Uh, is an issue. Uh, people look at Dataverse uh, mostly as like to upload their data. So hopefully with our user guide and uh, uh, other workshops, we can help with user onboarding. Running computational workflow is not an easy task. Uh, so we are looking into integrating with other third-party uh, apps like Alltail or Code uh, Ocean. Validation, there are some places are working on validating computational workflow. Uh, this is also, uh, if you are, if we want, decide to do it uh, automatic, it adds to challenges. So this is a topic that we will work uh, in our post MVP. Assigning credit for different parts because the workflow uh, data set might, uh, may consist code, data, and software, and assigning credit for a specific part is also challenging. Uh, and also uh, metadata. Uh, either we want to just describe it or add metadata for validation, metadata for runtime environment and, and dependencies. Uh, we only added few for our MVP phase uh, and we will add more for all of, for each of these purposes here. And uh, looking forward uh, after our MVP phase, uh, we are, looking into supporting a specific workflow, as I mentioned, visual, visualizing them, extracting information and displaying them in UI, running computational workflow, and also adding more metadata terms uh, in each of these categories, describing them more uh, for the validation purpose, uh, runtime environment, uh, and also dependency. Um, yeah, that's it. And I just want to acknowledge our leadership team and uh, uh, and everyone in Objective 2. I think a few of them are in this call, Kaylin and uh, Sonia. Um, yeah, I just want to thank the team for working on this and I'm happy to take any question if there's any. Thank you very much for this very, very interesting talk. So are there any questions <clears throat> so far? Just raise your hand or post your question in the chat. Perhaps one question for me, he said future directions would be visualizing workflows. So I think this could be quite complex as the broad heterogeneity of workflows. So are you thinking about four specific workflow languages, the workflows in this or uh, yeah, how? Exactly, how you, yeah. Uh, this is only possible uh, for a specific workflow. 
those are defined by a standard way like CWL. There are already libraries that are doing the valid, like the visualization, like showing the flow, uh, the steps. Yeah. Okay, we have a question from Gael Fogett. Um, but are you covering the cloud compute cost? I think in the metadata. <laughs> Uh, cloud compute cost, uh, mm. uh, not in the MVP phase, but uh, anything uh, regarding the runtime environment and uh, we are discussing as part of our post MVP. The challenges we've made with metadata is, although the more metadata it helps to get more information, uh, but then we need researchers to see and enter those information. And uh, if it's, entered by admin or people in charge of this, it's easier. But if you want to researchers to see then enter 20 metadata terms, 50 metadata terms, uh, often they skip it. Yeah, okay, thanks. There's another question from Jim Myers. Um, is the concept one data set has one workflow? Yeah, so when uploading data sets, if there is um, a computational workflow, uh, yeah, the goal is to each each computational wor workflow data set uh, has one workflow, but there are cases that uh, it becomes complex. For example, you have multiple workflow in your data set, but when running them, you have one big computational workflow. Uh, uh, and in user documentation, we try, we will, we, will uh, we are adding like notes on, uh, on best practices when uploading workflow. And the goal is if there are multiple workflows, they should be like connected and related, not just two independent workflow. Uh, but there, we cannot limit researchers. They may just come and upload two, like a data set and two workflow, which are not independent. One runs and produces different data set. The other one also produces different data set. Thanks a lot. Um... Are there, any, <laughs> are there any other questions or any other comments or perhaps discussion about all creation workflow or whatever topics here? To any of our panelists? Okay, I think that I just can thank um, to me just to thank all the presenters, all the talks, all the questions and comments, and thanks to everyone. And we are perfectly in time <coughs> finishing this session.